world is changed forever by a new technology, nuclear. Two superpowers dominate the world, each facing the other in a state of neither war nor peace. This is the story of the Cold War, how the push of one button could lead to total global destruction. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. How the struggle between two political systems caused millions to suffer. Spying was very much part of the Cold War. and how a world was created which lived in constant fear. Mad World, Mutually Assured Destruction. Today on Mad World, an island invasion causes international uproar. Grenada, we were told, was a friendly island paradise for tourists. Well, it was. The USA openly trains terrorists. Today, the Everglades area of Florida is a training ground for would-be counter-revolutionary guerrillas. And crimes against humanity. Allegations of drug smuggling, gun running, and human rights violations. Almost bring down a president. But let me put this in capital letters. I did not know about the diversion of funds. The Cold War gets hotter than ever became too dangerous, much more dangerous than, you know, when Russians were there. You could be killed at any time. And space age weapons changed the course of the nuclear age. They said, holy mackerel, they might actually be able to pull this off. October, 1983. The USSR is fighting for control in Afghanistan. The Cold War has been reignited. The USA is on tenterhooks. It appears the USSR has renewed the drive to conquer new territories. Both sides are closely watching a small island 200 kilometers off the South American coast. One of the prettiest of the Caribbean islands, Grenada's had nearly two years of radical socialist rule under Prime Minister Bishop. Grenada, a sovereign state since it was given independence by Britain in 1974, with the Queen as its head of state. It is a developing country. The island also produces a third of the world's supply of nutmeg and is renowned for growing some of the best cocoa beans in the world. Prime Minister Maurice Bishop is a Marxist. He is modeling his government on his communist neighbor, Cuba. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Our goal is to bring you award-winning documentaries that cover the events and figures that have shaped our world all in one place. Travel with us to the fascinating world of prehistoric Scotland or uncover the lives of the people who called Pompeii home. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% of their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. This is a government project, and the cement is donated by Cuba, one of many examples of aid from Fidel Castro. The Grenada government is also providing long-term, interest-free loans on completed dwellings, so that almost all Grenadians will be able to afford them. For the first time in their lives, Many Grenadians will be able to exchange their wooden shacks for the comforts of a modern home. Grenada is only a three and a half hour flight from Miami. The USA and most Caribbean nations are alarmed by a second Marxist country in their corner of the world. Apart from Cuba, all the other Caribbean governments are moderate or right wing. And so the voice of Radio Free Grenada is often a lonely one, 
and the new Reagan administration in Washington could make it lonelier still. So far, the Americans are on friendly terms with Grenada. Another area where Cuba is giving help is public health. There are some Peace Corps volunteers from the United States working here too, but the chief clinic doctor is Cuban. The influx of medical personnel from Cuba has doubled the number of doctors in Grenada, and the benefit to the people is visible already, especially among the young. Looking at it in more material terms, I would say the greatest achievements have been in the area of social benefits, in terms of improvements in health, education. It has come at a critical time when we need it most. Like all revolutionaries, Maurice Bishop hopes that educating the young in the new ideas will help to create a country built according to his vision. Bishop introduces equal rights, equal pay, and maternity leave for women. But his biggest project will be the downfall of Grenada. He invites Cuban troops and workers in. The new airport project mentioned by Maurice Bishop will cost an estimated $40 million, a quarter of that sum coming from Cuba. Previously, foreign visitors have had to fly into Barbados and then continue by boat or small aircraft. A boost in tourism is also hoped for when the new airport is operational. Officials have spoken in terms of a tripling of tourists. Tourism is the big hope for lifting this developing nation out of poverty. But Grenada's rich neighbor to the north is planning to put a stop to that. There have been rumblings in the American State Department that Cuba might want to use the new airport as a staging post for airlifting its troops to trouble spots around the world. The U.S. administration has even released satellite pictures of the complex. Officials claim that a recent survey of 25 New York travel agents resulted in 19 of them advising inquirers not to go to Grenada because the beaches were covered with barbed wire and there were Cuban and Soviet troops all over the place. 17 of them then admitted the information came from the U.S. State Department. All our reporting team saw, though, was bamboo huts and bikinis. Behind this idyllic scenery, turmoil is about to erupt. Prime Minister Bishop has so far refused to hold elections. His deputy stages a violent takeover, and within 24 hours, Bishop is killed. Grenada, we were told, was a friendly island paradise for tourism. Well, it wasn't. The new leader, Bernard Cord, is more extreme in his communist views. It takes the USA nine days to react. Grenada's flirtation with the Marxist government came to an end in 1983, when U.S. troops flooded in. The United States invades the nation of Grenada. Well, Grenada was the, the classic case of the, the sledgehammer and the, the nut, the full might of American military power being used to sort of quash this descent on a tiny island in the, the Caribbean. It's a lovely piece of real estate, remarked American Secretary of State George Shultz when US forces arrived, supposedly to rescue Grenada from its radical turn. In the final hours of the battle for Grenada, the Americans were still pouring in more combat troops who arrived at the new airport, one way following another. The build-up coincided with the arrival of helicopter gunships, all urgently needed reinforcements to end the fighting as quickly as possible. In the words of one American officer, they were using whatever it takes to free the island. We saw planes coming in, going out. We saw the battleships. The uh, radio free Grenada that was, uh, we think, bombed on, exploded three or four times. We were told afterwards it was an ammunition uh, site that they had blown up. 
In addition, the Americans have been making repeated airstrikes to weaken the Cubans and to allow ground forces to take up better positions. The Cuban forces will continue fighting until they are, as long as they are still under attack. The invasion of Grenada by Ronald Reagan probably sent a message to Castro because the Cubans were in Grenada in large numbers and it was the first and only time that the two sides came head to head directly militarily and the Cubans retreated very quickly. With the battle for the capital St. George is over, the Americans turned their full attention to the south. I'm not sure that it was very necessary for the enhancement of America's military power and certainly didn't do much for US reputation, but it was one of those many, many events during the Cold War years in which just ideology and determination to maintain power blocks led to all sorts of uh, extravagances. Grenada is a British Commonwealth nation. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher is not informed of the attack. Hello, Margaret Thatcher. Listen, we regret very much the embarrassment that's been caused you, and I'd just like to tell you what the story is from our end out here. Tapes of a private phone call between President Reagan and Prime Minister Thatcher have just been released. When your word came with your concerns, by the time I got it, the Zero hour had passed, and our forces were on their way. The British leader does not come to the aid of Grenada's Marxist government. I'm very much aware of sensitivity. Well, um, but the, the action is underway now, and we just hope that um, it will be successful. The United Nations General Assembly puts out a statement about the U.S. invasion, calling it a flagrant violation of international law. Members agree by 108 to 9 votes. I believe our government has a responsibility to go to the aid of its citizens if their right to life and liberty is threatened. Reagan believes that the nation that had been helping Grenada may have had more sinister designs. We had to assume that several hundred Cubans working on the airport could be military reserves. But as it turned out, the number was much larger, and they were a military force. 600 of them have been taken prisoner, and we have discovered a complete base with weapons and communications equipment, which makes it clear a Cuban occupation of the island had been planned. that at the very heart of what the Soviets wanted to do and what the Soviet system was, was about spreading communism globally. It wasn't about containing communism, it was about spreading communism. So I have no doubt that if allowed, Cuba would have essentially turned Grenada into a communist outpost, not of Cuba, of the Soviet Union, that was not only paying the way, but directing the strategy. Now that they've occupied the island, the Americans are determined to make sure Grenada does not come under future communist control. The purge of Marxist supporters continues and remaining elements of the Grenada army will be disbanded. Almost a week after the invasion, and the Americans are satisfied that their main objectives have been achieved, but their continuing presence is being counted in weeks rather than days. Grenada needs a period of healing right now. There are growing signs that the island community is slowly returning to some semblance of normality. The Governor-General, Sir Paul Schoon, places great emphasis on shops and offices opening up as soon as possible to restore people's faith in the future of Grenada. Its economy was reshaped according to principles of privatization, free trade and market-driven development. 
Grenada's first experiment with capitalism since independence begins. After six years of American stewardship, Grenada is deeper in debt than at any time in its past. Unemployment runs at around 30%, inflation about the same. Hard drug use, household burglary and violent street crime, all of which were rare a few years ago, are becoming widespread. But the reality is that the Americans have brought window dressing and little real development. We are looking for a better life in this country. That's what we need. The tiny island of Grenada could have been a tropical paradise, but through mismanagement and foreign interference, it now has all the hallmarks of a nation that's fallen into a coma. Now, the administration wants to give the Contras $100 million more. Mostly military aid. Why? In God's name, why? Many developing countries are trying out communism. For the USA, every time it puts out a fire, more seem to flare up. Well, the United States was more worried about Nicaragua than they probably were a lot of other places because that's over here in our hemisphere. Now, let me show you the countries in Central America where weapons supplied by Nicaraguan communists have been found. Honduras, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala. It began in Nicaragua in 1979. The population rises up against the country's military dictator. How long do you think this war will now last? I give it a week. And you think it'll all be over then? Anastasio Somoza will be the last in line from a family that has ruled Nicaragua for 43 years. They own big industrial monopolies and have siphoned off huge quantities of international aid. The Somoza family are worth about a billion US dollars. This situation is not going to be over until there is an end to the undeclared war between communism and the private enterprise people who believe in democracy and republican government. I was born in Managua, Nicaragua many years ago. The equality was in there, the wealth distribution was in there, and so they had to change some of the things. The people didn't want to have that sort of government anymore. there was no opportunity for the poverty. It's one of the things that took the government down. It took a determined popular uprising to defeat Somoza and his hated National Guard. His regime had become so corrupt that in the end, even the middle classes opposed it. In July 1979, after 18 months of open revolution, the rebel army enters the capital, Managua. I clearly remember that day because I went to the plaza and there was this euphoria from the whole country that Somoza had finally left. He had fled the country, he went to South America, to Paraguay to live, where he got killed months later. He left behind a country ravaged by the war which claimed 50,000 lives. Because the departing Somosistas took with them all the cash and gold reserves they could carry, Nicaragua's agriculture and industry have been in a bad way. The rebels call themselves the Sandinistas. They are determined to wipe out all traces of the Somoza regime. My father worked for the government in the early 60s and 70s. If you were a Somoza supporter, you'd be in trouble. My father was at home in, an, in, in the evening. He went to the backyard to have a look so he could see behind the fence. Like two men hiding behind trees. They had guns. And so he instantly thought that they were coming for him. You know, men were taken away from the houses, executed at gunpoint in front of their own family members. And so we went to the people next door through, through the backyard. 
in the morning, the next door neighbor on the other side said, look, just as good you left because they were prepared. They came back with, with weapons and there was a big car outside. Norma's father fled to safety in Costa Rica. The Sandinistas are communists. Just like the Grenadian communists, they bring socialist reforms to their people. When the Sandinistas took over in 1979, they had great ideas, plans of land reform, literacy programs. But also, like Grenada, the Sandinistas are receiving support from the USSR and Cuba. They've welcomed Cuban teachers and doctors in their hundreds, and they insist their role is purely humanitarian. For example, to attack the causes of infant mortality because in the past, illness and disease claimed the life of one in every 10 infants here. The human face of revolution was shown in a determined drive to provide health and education facilities for all the people, something which simply did not exist under Somoza. The Somoza supporters are also getting assistance from the USA. There was a, a decision made, and the basic strategy was to begin to roll back the gains that the communists had made, not only from 75 to 80, but in, uh, since 1945. Then Riga gets into power and then starts funding contracts, which meant for the people in Nicaragua, war wasn't over. Today, the Everglades area of Florida is a training ground for would-be counter-revolutionary guerrillas. Their families and friends were on the losing side in Cuba and Nicaragua. They lost property and power, and now they want it back. With a little help from their friends, they believe it's possible. The kind of people that we're talking about, that when that were the former National Guard, men and women who worked for the Somoza government before, and there were police men and police women who had a passion about the Somoza government, who fully supported him. So the tactics were, um, we're going to scare people off, we're going to make it back to power, we've got new leaders. Destabilize the economy, destabilize the peace and quiet time, the period that Nicaragua had gained at the time, which had only lived for a short time. The anti-government guerrillas are called the Contras. They are the key to the U.S. fight against communism in Central America. In the past, the Contras haven't had to ask. Since 1984, most of their money, $87 million, has come from American taxpayers. It's estimated that 20 to 30 million dollars more has come from private donors. As with all Cold War proxy conflicts, the other side is receiving arms and funds from the other superpower. Nicaragua and El Salvador are classic cases of where the Soviet Union used Cuba as a proxy to wage war against the Americans. Managua says 3,000 men and 24 helicopter gunships were used during the 15-day operation in the dense jungle of northern Nicaragua. 56 Contra rebels were said to have been killed, while eight Sandinista soldiers lost their lives. If it hadn't been for us, the United States would already have to be fighting in Central America. That we have done for this country. We have put up the blood, while this country had put up, has put up a few dollars. The Contras are running a campaign of terror against the Sandinista government. They are accused of rape, torture, and murder. It was a very sad time for Nicaragua because there were a lot of killings and a lot of you know, people dying in the mountains. And just hearing on the news about you know, so many people were found dead in, in mass graves. More evidence of atrocities emerge. There'll also be investigations into the way the Contras operate in the light of allegations of drug smuggling, gun running, and human rights violations. It's probably impossible to, uh, for the Contra atrocities and some of the drug dealing that was alleged to have gone on to have been prevented. In any war, there's going to be uh, these types of uh, things that happen. 
Another indication of the turmoil, the death squads have returned. Figures vary, but Western diplomats here put the average at 10 killings a day, most by the army or the right wing. In defiance of the president, the US Congress blocks further funding to the Contras. But the fighting continues in Nicaragua. Each side is still clearly being supported by a Cold War superpower. Soviet supplied ground-to-air missiles were used to shoot down the DC-6, which had dropped supplies to Contra rebels inside Nicaragua. At least four crewmen died. Another, captured after parachuting clear, confirmed that 11 packages of arms and supplies were dropped before the rockets hit. He said the captured crewman claimed the plane took off from Honduras's Swan Island, where he said 30 Americans were stationed. So we hope that rationality will prevail, will prevail in the US Congress, and they will opt for peace and not for war in Central America. President Reagan appeals to his country to continue the war. My fellow Americans, I must speak to you tonight about a mounting danger in Central America that threatens the security of the United States. This danger will not go away. It will grow worse, much worse, if we fail to take action now. Aren't you then saying that you advocate the overthrow of the present government of Nicaragua? Well, what I'm saying is that this present government was one element of the revolution against Somoza. Is the answer yes, then? To what? And to the question, aren't you advocating the overthrow of the present government? If Not you want to substitute another form of what you say was the revolution. Not of the revolutionary government, say, uh, come on back in, let's straighten this out and institute the goals. If you ask someone who witnessed, who lived through that era, they will tell you that the U.S. did not let them govern for 10 years. And that's the lost era that they called the 80s. Reagan tries everything to try to win over the American people. Gaddafi used to be far away, but now he sits on our doorstep, supplying arms and terrorist experts to the communists in Nicaragua, only two hours away from our borders. All of this, only two hours away from where we live. Support the president on Nicaragua. Should the United States be trying to influence the government of another nation in this hemisphere? I don't think the Sandinistas have a decent leg to stand on. Reagan cannot get enough support in the Senate. His next move threatens to take down his government. We don't know the exact amount yet. Our estimate is that it is somewhere between 10 and 30 million dollars. Reagan is accused of illegally circumventing Congress. His government is selling arms to Iran and diverting profits to the Nicaraguan Contras. I think in terms of the uh, process with respect to the U.S. Constitution, the, there, there's a legitimate reason for an inquiry into President Reagan's uh, knowledge and involvement in supporting the uh, Contras. But let me put this in capital letters. I did not know about the diversion of funds. For six years, the Contras have been fighting to overthrow the government of Nicaragua, relying on the generosity of others to pay for their fight. The Iran-Contra affair is an international scandal. Congressional hearings into the Iran arms affair are expected to begin next month, with renewed pressure on the central figures, Admiral John Poindexter and Colonel Oliver North, to tell all they know. Heads must roll. Vice Admiral John Poindexter has asked to be relieved of his assignment as assistant to the president for national security affairs and to return to another assignment of the Navy. Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North has been relieved of his duties on the National Security Council staff. Colonel North and Admiral Poindexter believed they were doing what I would have wanted done, keeping the democratic resistance alive in Nicaragua prevent uh, the U.S. government supporting the Contras uh, had uh, a little bit of a loophole in it. And the uh, Ali North, who was a good friend of mine and a little bit unusual, took advantage of that 
and uh, support was continued. Uh, and so there is a constitutional question there and a legal question as to whether uh, what the United States actually did was wrong or not. Mr. Hamilton, on the advice of counsel, I respectfully and regretfully decline to answer the question based on my constitutional rights. The hearings find no evidence against Reagan. The verdict that Oliver North acted alone is, for some, hard to believe. Uh, it just defies logic that uh, people at the level of uh, field grade officers uh, would uh, be making foreign policy for the United States. Documents that may shed light on the illegal Contra funding are secretly shredded. I was aware the resistance was receiving funds directly from third countries and from private efforts, and I endorse those endeavors wholeheartedly. The fighting and dying have spread beyond the borders of Nicaragua. And the five Central American presidents have joined together, and they've asked us not to send any more destructive weapons into their region. Central America is a war zone fired up by the big Cold War enemies. That the main reasons for the failure in a ceasefire lie with Washington, Moscow, and La Habana. Irregular military forces are incompatible with the peace plan. There are no parallel routes for war and peace in Central America. El pueblo organizado y armado en las milicias populares sandinistas. No answers. The president of Costa Rica, Oscar Arias, is a force for reason in Central America. External aid to the insurgent rebel forces must be discontinued. They will become the main cause that makes peace impossible in our region. Why don't you listen to President Arias, who opposes Contra aid? The Contras are not the solution in Central America. The Contras are the problem. Once the war was won, as the Sandinistas like to put it, they should have let them govern the way they thought it was better for the country. Without the interruptions, these people would have died. Looking back, uh, Nicaragua was uh, probably not as big a threat to um, spreading communism to the, the Western Hemisphere as it was originally thought. July 1987, all aid from the USA to the Contras is finally stopped. Now, the path toward a ceasefire is much easier. We have removed a very important obstacle. The Contras did not win because of lack of funding. The US government could not support them anymore. Nicaraguans took to the streets in a carnival atmosphere. With the economic situation deteriorating as a result of the war, and as well as Nicaraguans, some American volunteers in Managua also celebrated. Maria Zuniga, originally from Minneapolis, expressed her feelings. There was a great victory for the Nicaraguan people. There was a great victory for all of those of us, of you, who have worked so hard in solidarity with Nicaragua. Oscar Arias is given a Nobel Peace Prize in 1987 for his work in Central America. Nicaragua is emotionally and financially exhausted. In the dawn of the Sandinista Revolution, one of the proudest boasts was the gradual elimination of illiteracy. Now, like health care, the educational system is blighted by the economic climate. And the most vulnerable fall prey to disease. Epidemic and hunger have reached levels associated with the poorest of third world countries. Sandinista advances in preventative medicine have been reversed. 70% of those under the age of six are malnourished. Gastroenteritis is a ruthless killer. Ten years on, another sound is ringing out in Nicaragua. Viva Nicaragua libre! It's a cry born of a decade of suffering, of a cruel war. Que 
nuestras tierras se piensan robar. The nuclear arms race is about to go into hyperdrive. March 1983. President Reagan launches a futuristic defense program. It will have nuclear satellites, rail guns, and X-ray lasers, all based in space. You're talking about ballistic missiles traveling at very high rates of speed in large numbers in some cases, uh, multiple warheads, lots of the unknown locations, minutes to react at best. It was a defense system which would actually shoot down surface-to-surface -surface missiles before they reached their target. It's the path for both sides to a safer future, a system that defends human life instead of threatening it. SDI will go forward. The Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, a collection of sensors and weapons designed to destroy incoming Soviet nuclear weapons. And that's why by pursuing SDI, which is a defense against offensive missiles, we're moving away from the so-called policy of mutual assured destruction by which nations hold each other hostage to nuclear terror and destruction. The concept of mutually assured destruction goes right out the window and the U.S. reemerges with an absolutely unassailable strategic advantage. Many believe mutually assured destruction has kept the two superpowers from direct conflict for nearly 40 years. Reagan does not agree. He describes MAD as a suicide pact. As I told the British Parliament in 1982, we seek to rid the world of the two great nightmares of the post-war era, the threat of nuclear war and the threat of totalitarianism. Reagan wants an alternative to MAD, a high-tech scenario that will allow the USA to survive a nuclear attack. You know, I mean, you were pushing the boundaries of physics, you were pushing the boundaries of materials. It's constantly changing and morphing, and so nothing ever really gets to a configuration where it's actually bought and deployed. And part of that is because of the difficulty of actually accomplishing uh, a shield. To, to shield us from a bunch of incoming ICBMs. The problem is, none of this technology exists. I made it clear that our SDI program will continue and that when we have a defense ready to deploy, we will do so. The American Physical Society states that it will take 10 more years of research to establish whether SDI is even feasible. You're dealing with a, a saturation attack, and so you've got to have some technology that is uh, quick. So many of these things are, are just almost uh, uh, impossible to do, and yet uh, somehow the Russians believed uh, that we could do all this. We leaked enough of the capabilities that we were starting to develop to the Soviets that they said, holy mackerel, they might actually be able to pull this off. But it was a, a bit of poker. Uh, it was just another example of America saying, we have technological superiority. You guys know it. We're going to develop something that's going to uh, make your uh, offensive nuclear forces less capable and less effective. And you better worry about it. The USSR is by far the biggest country in the world but it cannot afford to develop its own SDI. A new leader is about to take his nation on a very different course. At the start of his leadership, Gorbachev looked like his predecessors, but he soon made it clear that his style was to be very different. March, 1985. Mikhail Gorbachev is the first leader of the USSR who did not live through the Russian Revolution. Gorbachev I did work with as an interpreter uh, and uh, had a really good impression of him as a human being. He was one of the few heads of state that I've worked with who would really treat you as a human being, approach you, was willing to take a photograph with you, have a little chat. Since stepping onto the diplomatic merry-go-round when he became leader of one of the most powerful nations on earth, Mikhail Gorbachev hardly seems to have paused for breath. 
Old Guard ideas are out, and Russia is offered a new revolution. Political and social changes had to be made. Perestroika or reconstruction was, he wrote, the only way forward in a new atmosphere of glasnost or openness. When President Gorbachev came into power, there was a sea change of attitude. He introduced things called glasnost and perestroika to, I think, make efforts to reduce the tension in the world. Gorbachev grew up operating combine harvesters, gained a law degree, and quickly rose through the Communist Party ranks. His first meeting with Ronald Reagan is a crossroads for the Cold War. Just over a month ago, General Secretary Gorbachev and I met for the first time in Geneva. Our purpose was to begin a fresh chapter in the relations between our two countries and to try to reduce the suspicions and mistrust between us. But the relationship between the superpower leaders only threatens to increase mutual mistrust. Gorbachev and Reagan begin a series of game-changing talks in Reykjavik. The agenda, reducing nuclear weapons. The talks come to an abrupt halt. In Iceland last October, we had one moment of opportunity that the Soviets dashed because they sought to cripple our strategic defense initiative, SDI. I wouldn't let them do it then. I won't let them do it now or in the future. President Gorbachev lobbies hard to stop SDI. But while here, he's expected to push Mitterrand for French support over his campaign against Reagan's strategic defense initiative. I've made it clear that there's no way that we can give up SDI, which we believe is offering an opportunity for peace for the world. And as Mr. Gorbachev carries out the formal program of his visit, here a wreath laying at the Arc de Triomphe, the Soviet leader is leaving no chance untaken to ram home his message which is that there must be no arms race in space. Gorbachev believes if he puts money into a competing SDI program, the Soviet economy will be crippled. He spoke of the efforts to find an alternative and mocked America's strategic defense initiative as a dangerous illusion. In its place, the Soviet leader proposed a complete ban on all space weapons and a 50% cut in the Soviet and American missiles aimed at each other's soil. By the mid-1980s, hopes of warming relations between East and West are fading. Between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The other day, the, uh, uh, the Soviet officials were complaining about such things as uh, Rambo movies and Rocky movies, which cast the Soviets in a bad light. Uh, do you think that's an appropriate sort of thing? Are you talking to your friends in Hollywood about the kind of movies being made these days? <laughs> no, I was talking to my friends in Hollywood back at a time when they seemed to be making pro-communist pictures. President, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, really blasted you on Soviet television yesterday, accusing you of provoking another Cold War and criticizing you for refusing to negotiate on the test ban treaty. I evidently wasn't aware of that, that he said all those things, things about me. Uh, there, he must have been reason, reading Pravda and Tass too much. Why don't we send him some American newspapers? He was asked by a press conference, Mr. President, what is your strategy for dealing with the Soviet Union? And he, he kind of smiled, his normal uh, smile, and a glint in his eye, and he said, my strategy is we win, they lose. I just want to follow up. Do you think you're going to see Mr. Gorbachev again during your term, or do you think he's thinking that he'll wait for the next president to negotiate an arms control agreement? I have to believe there's reason for optimism. August 1987. Another attempt to warm up the Cold War is made. I am optimistic that we'll soon witness a first in world history, the sight of two countries actually destroying nuclear weapons in their arsenals. A ray of hope pierces the Cold War cloud. A treaty is drawn up that will turn the tide on the nuclear arms race. We're making real progress on the global elimination of an entire class of nuclear weapons. The U.S. and Soviet Intermediate Range, or INF missiles. President Reagan extends a hand of friendship. And Mr. Shevardnadze presented a letter to me from General Secretary Gorbachev, who has accepted my invitation to come to Washington for a summit 
beginning on December 7th. In December, the first Soviet leader to step foot on U.S. soil in 12 years is greeted by the American public. Common sense has won. Reason has won. People want to live in a world in which they would not be haunted by the fear of nuclear catastrophe. People want to live in a world in which everyone would enjoy the right to life, freedom, and happiness. The strongest of all warriors are those two, time and patience. December the 8th. The treaty to destroy all intermediate-range nuclear missiles is ready to be signed. But I will venture to say that what we are going to do, the signing of the first ever agreement eliminating nu nuclear weapons, has a universal significance for mankind, both from the standpoint of world politics and from the standpoint of humanism. It is a milestone in both the relationship between Reagan and Gorbachev and a turning point in global history. Yes, yes, I recognize it. He was a great man. And not only a great man, of America. Mikhail Gorbachev also makes plans for peace much closer to home. He wants the Soviet Union to pull out of the Afghan war. Anybody who goes in, into Afghanistan is crazy. <laughs> Soviets were more so, perhaps, because it was also kind of a desperate act to reinforce their credentials, to expand their sphere of influence and all that. Ended up, obviously, in a total nuclear disaster. During the course of the war, uh, the Americans' uh, support of the Northern Alliance uh, kept uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, from really uh, sort of conquering Afghanistan. We had gotten bogged down in Vietnam and other places. We sort of returned the favor to them. The Afghan problem remains Gorbachev's biggest foreign affairs dilemma. When he addresses the United Nations General Assembly early in December, it's thought likely he'll repeat his claim that Pakistan is interfering with the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Afghanistan. Afghanistan is draining the Soviet Union's economy and destroying too many lives. It has become Russia's Vietnam. It's difficult for our soldiers. It's difficult for the Afghanis. It's time to reach peace there. Mitino Cemetery outside Moscow. Here, the graves of young men who've fallen in the war, Gorbachev's called a bleeding wound. It was a, a deeply hostile environment then and now for outsiders, and the Soviets certainly paid that price. Geneva, 1988. An agreement for peace is reached. Excellencies. a most significant achievement. They represent a major stride in the effort to bring peace to Afghanistan. Beginning on May 15th, to withdraw 50% of their troops in the first three months, in other words, and to complete the withdrawal of all troops by February 15th, 1989. In 1989, as Russian left, uh, Afghanistan, uh, the situation became very, very desperate. Kabul was uh, under attack. Um, you know, there were many, many rockets um, hit and shot at um, different parts of Kabul and major cities.
Soviet entrance into Afghanistan, whether or not they were invited or whether or not they were just seizing an opportunity for geostrategic advantage, was an absolute catastrophe um, for the Soviet Union, just as it unhappily rather proved to be uh, years later for the uh, Americans. The Mujahideen have been allied with the USA for 10 years. For them, the peace treaty does not go far enough. Kabul because it became too dangerous, uh, much more dangerous than, you know, when Russians were there. Um, you know, you could be killed any time. Now that these Soviet troops are to go, the questions are beginning to become more urgently asked. What happens next? <laughs> 